Okay, I think I am going to get us started. Um, my name is Laura Schramm, and I'm the Director of Professional and Academic Development at Rackham Graduate School. I welcome you to our workshop today on the job search beyond the professoriate. Um, let's see. I wanted to just briefly go over some webinar guidelines. I want to flag that I understand we are all feeling a lot of stress right now. So please, as you're in the webinar, practice self-care for yourself if that means taking breaks or leaving early. We understand. And as you can see, we've already had our first question, but we invite you to use the Q&A function to ask questions at any point in the webinar. If you have attended a lot of Zoom meetings, you may be a little bit more familiar with um, using the chat function to ask questions, but we would encourage you to use the Q&A function because it has some great functions for a webinar with a large audience. We have about 130 folks in the room right now. Um, you can ask questions anonymously. You can also upvote a question that one of your colleagues asked that you also um, would like to see answered. And you can also comment on questions from other attendees. And Dr. Krug will answer um, questions both at various points in the workshop and at the end of our time together. Um, we do invite you, if you have a technological challenge, um, to let us know by using the chat. As you can see, in addition to Dr. Kook, who is our main presenter, we have um, several Rackham staff who are also panelists, and that's because in such a large meeting like this, um, we wanted to assist with moderating the Q&A and um, responding to any technological issues that come up in the chat. So just let us know and one of us will work with you. Um, I am briefly going to introduce our presenter, Dr. Ann Krook. She offers training and consulting to graduate students and postdocs who uh, want to prepare to seek non-academic employment. And she also consults with faculty, deans, and directors of graduate students who want to support their students in exploring diverse careers. I am not going to share her very interesting full professional bio because um, she said she wants to weave that into her presentation. So with that, um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kook. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, yes, that is okay. All right, I am gonna share my screen. Share, okay. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so today, here's what I'm going to walk you through. I know a lot of graduate students look for non-academic jobs, and those searches are often way different from the ones that graduate school gets you ready for. My goal is that at the end of this session, you will know how to search for non-academic work should you ever want or need to. So here's what today is going to look like. We have two hours, which includes time for questions. Uh, if you would, uh, you should have all received the slide list, which will help you follow and take notes. And you should have access to the Excel template exercise, uh, the first tab of which is instructions and the Word resume. So if you have them open, that will uh, help us all. Um, my Michigan colleagues will make sure I see questions in the Q&A panel. You should also feel free to take notes via phone photos or to tweet or post about the session if you wish. But don't feel you have to capture absolutely everything now because I am going to send you templates of the exercise, a PDF of the slides, uh, and the resumes that we discuss. You're going to get all that stuff. So here's the formal agenda. I'm going to start off with a section on graduate training and the non-academic job market. Uh, I'm going to talk about how you can prepare yourself right now. And then I'm going to talk about the academics of the non-academic job search. And that is uh, the bulk of our time together. And then there are three sessions that are briefer, what you should do next, 
uh, some resources and some reminders. Okay, first thing, the graduate training and the non-academic job market. Uh, the first section is about me, me, me. Uh, and then the second uh, section is about how people like me look at people like you when we are hiring. So uh, my career path so far, uh, I am a faculty brat. My father taught veterinary medicine at Cornell for a hundred years. And I went right from high school to college to graduate school. And uh, when I was uh, 26 years old, I was an assistant professor at Michigan. Then I became a bartender. Uh, and then I transitioned into corporate technology. I was at Amazon for many years. Uh, I was vice president at a startup. And then I was vice president at a medium sized engineering firm. Uh, and now I uh, chair the board of directors. I'm actually the immediate past chair. I just transitioned. Uh, and I'm a consultant and an author doing what you see me doing now. So you can see why the term path is in quotation marks. Now, here's part of what everybody wants to know, which is how on earth did I make those changes? So what, the first change was a forced change. I was at Michigan and I didn't get tenure, so I needed a job. Uh, I moved to Seattle and I got a bartender's license. The second change was one I sought out. Uh, I was a bartender, but I was looking for a, a full-time day job. And I talked to a friend of mine who I played softball with in graduate school, uh, and he told me about Amazon. And I interviewed with them and I discussed my skills, not so much about my previous jobs, um, but I got new skills at Amazon and I knew, used them to take on new roles. I learned absolutely everything I know about technology on the job at Amazon. Um, and then I, when I became chair of the board of directors, this was an unsought change, um, uh, but voluntary. I had been a donor for a number of years um, and I hated their website and I hated their Twitter feed and I hated everything about their technology and I complained about them constantly. Um, and just as I was leaving Amazon, a friend of mine said to me, you know, if you hate it so much, you could help them make it better. So I spent about a year consulting with them uh, about how to improve their web properties. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, I was invited to join the board of directors uh, and then elected uh, to chair the board. So there are three examples of change, one that was forced, one that I sought, and one that I didn't seek, but that I took up. So uh, what do we learn from this? This is an incredibly important point for PhD people. Many, many jobs do not require a specific credential, but all jobs require skills. We hope that everybody who's operating on you in an operating room has MD after her name. And we hope that all the pilots at the front of the airplane have pilot licenses. Um, but most jobs are not like that. Most jobs do not require credentials, but every job requires skills. This is the thing I knew least when I went uh, to Michigan because I was a faculty brat. Non-academic work is awesome. It is interesting, it is challenging, it is varied, and it's always developing. And you don't know what you could be doing. Uh, I didn't know what e-commerce was until I stepped into it. Um, and you know, you're gonna spend part of your career in fields that don't exist now. There's also a lot of ways to engage with it. Um, academics tends to make you think, first you get a credential and then you get a job. But I learned a ton on the job. Um, and your interests, not just your training, uh, can lead to a job. And so, and finally, if you complain about it, ask yourself if you can help fix it. Uh, nobody I have spoken to at these sessions has yet taken this, has yet taken me up on this for the cable companies. But man, if you can fix that, please do. And then finally, and I am the best example of this, you can get an academic job and still need to change jobs. So if you are here and your goal is a, to get an academic job, go Tiger, I hope you get one. But I also hope you learn this stuff 
because it is possible that you one day will need or want to change jobs. So that was sort of me, me, me. But here I want to talk about how a non-academic employer like me thinks about graduate training. If you're getting a job in a related field, a PhD indicates your commitment to advanced training, and it could be an advantage. But for those of you who are going to look further afield, uh, it's not really an advantage or a disadvantage, but here's what it is to an employer. It's a choice you made about how to spend your time that you will need to explain, uh, including why you did not finish if you don't, or why you did finish if you do, because you guys have made a big investment in time and in cost and in opportunity cost. Now, I like hiring people with graduate training, and here's why. Uh, I like especially that we tend to look at really persistent, difficult problems in new ways. I like that we all think that other people have things to teach us, right? We've been in a teaching environment for a long time and, and it's great. We value collegiality, right? We're in an environment with lots of people who teach and lots of people who learn and we listen to them. And then finally, because we've been teachers, um, we realize that explaining some things is hard and learning some things is hard. All of these are terrific traits of people in workplaces. Now, there is a dark side to the force. Um, some people, especially people like me who entered the field very young, have a narrow view of intelligence. You're all here because you've succeeded in the academic world. Um, and sometimes that sells other types of intelligence short because people associate smart with academics. And I am here to tell you that there's a lot of other smart people out there. Also, some people believe that intellectually rewarding work must be found in academic workplaces. So I sometimes hear graduate students, particularly in the humanities, say things like, oh, you know, if I can't get a job as a faculty member, I'm definitely going to look to be, you know, a university librarian, or I'm going to work at admissions or, you know, alumni relations or something. And those jobs are awesome, and they are interesting and challenging. But I also want you to believe that there's really terrific, interesting, challenging work out there. And then finally, uh, this is a, a really tough one psychologically. Some people with graduate training think if you take other kinds of work, you are not using your degrees, um, and they get resentful. And I am here to tell you that nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, your degrees are now part uh, of your mental makeup. They are part of how you approach problems intellectually and of how you learn new stuff. Please do not sell yourself short by thinking that if you work outside the academy, you are not using your degrees. So I wanted to uh, just put up this list of what my former graduate students are doing and uh, my fellow former academics. Um, they're doing a lot of actually cool stuff. And I want to particularly call out the faculty member um, uh, who now directs study abroad at a university. And she was one of my graduate students at the University of Michigan. Uh, she, like a lot of academics, liked traveling abroad and she does research there. But like a lot of academics, she didn't have a ton of money. So what she did and what she does is she does those three-week sessions in the summer uh, where you go for three weeks and study intensive art history in London or something like that. And, um, and it turns out when you take uh, 30 undergraduates abroad at a time, you learn all kinds of interesting things. You learn, for example, what to do when one of your students uh, has a little too much to drink in a London bar and propositions the ambassador's daughter. Uh, and you learn what to do when uh, the same student, apparently, uh, goes up to, you know, those tall guards in London with the tall furry hats uh, and throws up on their shoes. Uh, so lots of things you learn. 
Anyway, when the director of her program retired, she was invited to apply for the job. Uh, and she got the job and that's now half of what she does. And what is interesting to me about this is primarily two things. One is she didn't realize that was a job uh, until she was invited, until she got to the school and eventually was invited to apply for the job. But the second thing she didn't realize uh, is that all of the things she had learned in the years she spent taking students abroad were skills and they helped prepare her to get that job. So I'm going to encourage you and have an exercise later in this session uh, to think about skills that you may not know you have. So, uh, and at the end of this slide, I'm going to take questions. So how to adapt to the non-academic job search. I want you to believe that there is interesting, awesome work for you. I want you to describe your skills, not primarily your credentials. I want you to broaden the range of people you seek out for help, and I'm going to teach you how to do that. I want you to treat everybody you meet along the way as a valued uh, and respected colleagues. One of the kind of icky things about academics is its academic class hierarchy, where um, you know tenured faculty are at the top, and your dissertation director is at the top, and you know, and there can be a tendency not to treat everybody quite as well. And then finally this, I want this to be your message to an employer. My skills can help solve your challenges. Okay, I'm gonna stop now and I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Schramm or Elling um, or Ms. Willis or Dr. Jensen to let me know if there are questions and then I'll answer them. We do have a logistical question um, about um, whether people can pass on the materials from your workshop, Dr. Krug, to colleagues in their department who weren't able to attend? They absolutely may. Okay. And then we have a second question. Should you put your PhD on your resume if you're searching for non-academic work? Um, can that automatically over-qualify you for some positions? Uh, you can certainly put it on, and uh, in the section around the resume, I will talk about where and how to do that. Great question. We also have a question of what your degree is in. What's your background? Uh, 17th and 18th century British literature, uh, the literary, uh, literary approaches to the Bible, uh, literary approaches to classical literature, uh, and detective fiction. So as you can tell, completely perfect for learning how to build out data centers. And our, we also have a question when the recording will be available. It's recording to the cloud in Zoom right now. So it will be available by the end of today, but we may not be able to send it out till Monday since our webinar ends towards the end of the workday. Um, I see if you were 26 when you were an ass assistant professor, when did you have to switch to becoming a bartender and then Amazon? Uh-huh. Uh, I left uh, Michigan after seven years. I was denied tenure in my sixth year. I had one more year. I looked for more academic jobs and didn't get them. Uh, and then I tended bar the year after that in Seattle. And then after a year as a bartender, I got a job at Amazon. Um, what is your suggested approach to think expansively about available paths? Ah, uh, that is much of the rest of this talk. So hold fire and I will address it. Perfect. I see another couple coming in. Um, will you discuss a way to transition from preclinical um, animal model work for PhD to working in a more clinical role or a consultant? Is that too far of a jump? Uh, it's not too far of a jump, and I will show you how to make it by describing your skills. Is the kind of exploratory hiring of companies like Amazon still a possibility in the current economic certification heavy hiring market? Is the quote shadow market highly conditioned by where you live? Uh, unsatisfactorily, the answer is sometimes. Uh, but I will also address that. Okay. I think we, those are all of our open questions. Okay. Super. More will come. And onward. 
All right, so now I'm going to talk about how you can prepare yourself for the non-academic job market from where you are now. Uh, and there are three elements to this. One is broadening your self-description. Another is finding people to help your job search. Uh, and another is about preparing yourself mentally. Here we go. So first, um, broadening your self-description. I assume your self-description currently looks something like this, right? I'm a graduate student or a postdoc in this field and I have this expertise. Um, I'm an experienced researcher and I do this, that, and the other thing. I am a scholar, I've presented this and published that, and I am in training to become a PI or a faculty member. Very often, people internalize in graduate school, this is who I am. I wanna suggest that there is another way. So I complete large projects with minimal supervision, right? Every paper or every research project. Uh, I am hiring you because I don't have time or energy to do the job myself. Uh, I have worked in large enterprises and medium-sized organization within the enterprise. Um, the gentlemen have been telling us for years that size matters. And this is one of, the one of the instances where they do. We all know people who are comfortable in small colleges and people who are comfortable in big universities. One of the things that's really important is for you to be able to explain the size of the organizations that you've been working with. I have participated in and led small teams within the enterprise. I hear all the time from graduate students, oh, I have no leadership experience. And honestly, that's almost never true um, because most graduate students have led a TA group or they have been on a research team or they've trained an, an undergraduate intern or something like that. I use research and analytical skills to identify problems. Writing a proposal in the academic world and writing a proposal in the non-academic job world are the same thing. This is what work is, identifying problems and solving them. <laughs> I manage contentious discussions toward productive conclusions. Um, I got my first promotion, or, or was recommended for my first promotion at Amazon in the following way. I was leading a horribly contentious meeting and I was trying to figure out where it had all gone sideways until a light bulb went off over my head saying, oh, they're all acting like sophomores. Um, and then what I started doing is teaching uh, and then it started to go better. Um, I persuade reluctant adopters to accept and deploy standards. So if you have trained new lab staff or taught freshman chem or freshman English or, fre or freshman calculus, you have done this. There is a whole series of jobs out there that are about saying, here are the standards of this field and here's why they're valuable and here's what we get when we follow them. And you're ready to do that. A much better internalization than this is who I am is this is what I do. Because what you do is valuable to employers. Now, once you have um, uh, thought about who you, about what you do, uh, you have to think about the vehicle for that self-description, which is different in academics and not. Uh, in academics, a CV is written in academic shorthand, and it's evaluated by skilled readers who understand CVs, and it's comprehensive. When I was at the University of Michigan English Department, um, I was on two job searches, and I read all the applications that came in from graduate students, and I knew exactly how to read them. I knew exactly what their schools meant, and I knew what their PhDs meant, and I knew what their publications meant, and I knew exactly how to read them. And I was the most junior person uh, on the search committees. Now, a resume, on the other hand, is written for people who may not know how to read CVs, but what they need to know is what you can do to help solve their problems. It also may initially be evaluated by entry-level employees or by software. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. It is also selective. I mean, a CV is in some ways really easy because it's a reverse chronological listing of everything you've ever done sorted by category. 
but a resume is selective and has to be. So to write a resume instead of a CV, you have to gather information from your entire work history, and then you have to describe your jobs, your achievements, and your skills. So how do you do this thing? Uh, first, you have to gather information from your resume, for your resume. Now, here is where I have to start to um, undo and deprogram you a little bit. Graduate school rewards a narrow focus, um, but the non-academic job searches reward a broad one. To, to succeed in graduate school, you have to forget all kinds of things about yourself, all kinds of hobbies, all kinds of pathways, all kinds of interests, so you can focus. Um, but in the non-academic job search to get ready for it, you can remember those things. So what you need to do is you need to remember where you've lived and what you did. You need to define, sort, and count the skills you have gained. And here's what this process does. It reminds you um, what you know, which is more than you think, and it will help you create a rudimentary skills database out of which to build your resume. Now, I'm going to do a template exercise with you. So what you need to do is you need to get that Excel spreadsheet out. I am momentarily going to stop sharing this screen and start sharing another one. Don't be alarmed. Stop share. Share screen. Course for PhDs and candidates. Share. Uh, Laura, can you please confirm for me that you can see the uh, Excel spreadsheet? Yes, I see it. Okay, thank you much. All right, this is the instructions tab all the way to the left. And this is a template exercise. Um, it is a glorified Excel spreadsheet uh, that will help you remember, describe, sort, and count your skills. Uh, and this is the instructions tab. So the first thing you should do is go to the first tab marked Remember. What this asks you to do is to write down all the things about yourself that have gone into making you who you are. And so I have grouped things here by the way people talk about themselves and their lives, where they lived, where they went to school, travel, languages, you know, all the organizations they've been on. And that ugly pink column uh, in Excel uh, is the one where you will list in order your jobs and your volunteering. Uh, and that is something you will need later on, which I will explain. And then there's a column for other characteristics. Uh, and I will talk about what that means. Now, uh, I don't find templates actually incredibly helpful. So what I did is I filled this out for myself. And here's what that looks like. Um, and man, I went all the way back to the beginning, right? So every place I have lived, uh, every place I went to school, uh, travel I have done, uh, languages, um, teams I have played on, organizations, lessons, houses of worship, um, and then the jobs I've held, and I noted which were volunteer. Then look at the other characteristics. This is something that a lot of graduate students uh, have a hard time uh, with, because again, they focus so much in graduate school. I've always owned dogs. What does it mean that I'm good with dogs? I'm a huge reader. I'm interested in politics. I'm comfortable in large organizations. I'm a very good public speaker. I'm good with languages. I'm comfortable talking about all kinds of sports. Uh, raised in a scientific household and with visual art and intellectual degreement, disagreement. One of my parents was a non-native speaker of English. I want you to think about all this stuff because it makes you you, and you are gonna have to explain that on a resume. Now, this exercise, uh, takes, I don't know, I think it takes two hours over a couple sessions. And it will be helpful if you can show it to a sibling or an old friend, because you tend to forget a lot of stuff. 
again, graduate school really narrows your focus um, and it makes you forget. And I am here to sort of trepan your skull and go into your brain and help you remember because all of this stuff um, is going to be useful. So this is the first part. This is uh, in some ways uh, easy. And now I am going to show you a part that is much harder. Oh, but before I do that, I will say this. Uh, the first time I showed this exercise, uh, somebody said to me, well, and that's easy for you because you're senior and you've got a lot of stuff on there. So what I did was this. I went to this tab, and I'm sorry it's small at this um, display. I went to this tab and I highlighted everything in red that happened after my PhD. And the important thing about this is that almost everything on this list was present when I was where you are now. Almost everything that made me get my first job at Amazon, in fact, everything that made me get my first job at Amazon was there when, when, I, am, when I was where you are now. And I hope that gives you confidence because going out uh, into the job world, I understand can be a scary thing, uh, but you are more than you think you are now and you have more skills than you think you do. And this is a first way of sort of gathering them. Um, anyway, but look at that ugly pink column and, and sort of after the next uh, two tabs, I'm gonna take questions. But then you take that, the information from this column and you copy it uh, to this sheet. Because once you have described all the things you've done and remembered stuff, then you've gathered up all your jobs. Uh, then I want you to tell me what you have done at those jobs. And you have done a couple things. You have done, you've had various roles and in those roles, you've exercised various skills. So here's what this looks like for me. Uh, and I wanna go down, because you know I've had a lot of jobs over the time. I wanna go down to where sort of you are now. So let's look at teaching assistant. So when I was a teaching assistant, that's what I was, that's the role. Uh, there's a lot of things I did. Interpreting the non-obvious, time management, clear written explanations, clear oral explanations, engagement of the disparately skilled. One of the things that you obviously know from teaching or lab work or anything like that uh, is that the students who come in have, shall we say, varying levels of interest in what you do and varying levels of experience and varying levels of talent. But you have to teach all of them. That is an extraordinarily valuable skill in the workplace because the people you work with are not all gonna have the same levels of experience and skill and anything, and, but you've all gotta to work together toward a common end. A uh, couple other things. When I was uh, a research assistant uh, for my dissertation director, I did library research. Uh, she also asked me to line edit uh, some of her uh, articles and uh, tact, ooh, I was editing my dissertation director and uh, about halfway through the first edit I did for her, I realized that I had written some comments that were perhaps somewhat better suited to freshmen. So I had to change. Um, and then the final thing I wanna talk about before I take questions uh, is if you look at line 66 there for when I was treasurer of my, uh, I spent a year in England and uh, I was treasurer of the graduate student union there. And I did obviously math, but I also did budget allocation. And this is an absolutely perfect example of a skill that my employers value, but that absolutely did not matter at all to the people who hired me to be an assistant professor. But it actually all these skills matter um, when you go out in the non-academic job world. Uh, and that's why I'm training you um, to gather the information about them and to remember them. So uh, now I wanna throw it over to Laura and ask you to please uh, tell me what questions are out there. We have a couple questions already. Um, 
One person asks, how selective are we talking for a resume? Is it one page, two pages, however long you need? Uh, I will address that question particularly around the resume because there's a whole cluster of questions that go together. That's the very next thing. Okay, perfect. Um, one person says they're interested in alternative academic and non-academic positions where they can still do academic things. And this person wonders what types of skills are grant funding foundations looking for and how can PhDs and social sciences leverage those skills and stand out? Uh, they are looking, and again, I'll talk about this on the resume, um, but they are looking for exactly uh, the same skills that non-academic employers are. In fact, um, I know particularly from my time at Amazon that there's a lot of grant writers there because they describe complex problems to organizations, for example, for government grants to work with AWS. So a lot of skills about synthesizing information, writing clear and concise prose, and explaining complex problems to interested non-specialist readers are absolutely at the top of the skills list. Mm -hmm. Incredibly valuable. Do we have any more questions? Oh, two more just popped up. Um, when you highlight something like budget allocation, doesn't it feel flimsy when set against, say, someone who's been doing that in a professional capacity full time versus like managing a budget for a graduate group or a grant project? Um, how do you frame this well without overselling yourself? Um, so I will talk about that on a resume, but the point of it here is for you to capture the skills because most graduate students don't even believe they have these skills at all or that they are skills. And I am here to tell you that you have them and that they're skills. And absolutely, you will not, uh, you know, you will not be hired to be the CFO or the head of budget at a nonprofit for your first uh, gig out of a PhD in English. But what, you but what you will show an employer is that you are interested in things other than your PhD in English and that you are capable and can do other things. And I'll talk a little bit about how to not overpromise and underdeliver. Um, someone wondered, related to one of the recent questions, how do you talk about old experiences and skills without seeming naive or overly young and inexperienced? Um, and another person asked, like, should these skills and resume go all the way back to high school? So a little bit about, right. you know, how far back to go and talking about so the way you go, you, you go back exactly as far as is relevant to the employer. And I'll talk about how to set that cutoff on the resume. But the important thing is, if you go back to that uh, sentence I highlighted and read at the beginning, um, my skills can help solve your challenges. You define the relevance of your work to the employer's job. And so if what you did in high school is not relevant, that's, you don't go back to high school. Um, but I had a PhD student um, leave for a, a job at GM. And even though they had a PhD, they actually went all the way back to high school because they had worked in their uncle's car dealership. And so they had hands-on experience. And even though it was from when they were 16 years old, it was really, really relevant. And they made it relevant. That was the important thing. They explained how it was relevant. Um, a couple more questions. Will we talk about postdocs? I'm wondering whether I should even do a scientific research postdoc if I don't want to work in academia, but I still want to work in a laboratory. Uh, yes, I will address that a little bit later. Okay, great. Um, I don't see more personal experiences here. For example, being a working parent, which requires multitasking skills, a housewife, which requires organizing skills. Is it a good idea to consider some personal experiences in this exercise? Absolutely. And so when you, if you go back to, um, I'll show my own, to, uh, whoops, sorry, not that one, um, to remember, um, you will see that uh, like in 10 there for the job I did, uh, I was a volunteer handicap van driver. Uh, I have been a supply preacher in my house of worship. So there's things I have done that are personal 
um, that nonetheless contributed to how I think about the world and the working world. And that is absolutely true um, uh, for working parents as well. And in fact, late in the presentation, I'll talk about a blog post specifically that I've written about how to talk about those skills. Great. Any other questions? I don't see any open okay. ones now, so maybe I'll give it one second. All right. So no. Okay. So here are the skills, and then now the this part of the exercise is uh, hellish. It's very very hard, and it takes a long time. You should plan to spend six to eight hours on this over three different sessions uh, because it's really hard. And the hard thing is describing things you did with common language. Um, now, but the payoff for once you've, d you've done this, because what you've done is you've created a rudimentary database of your skills. Now you've done the hard work. So here is where it pays off for you, because the next thing I want you to do is to sort those skills. Um, and then when you sort them, uh, this is why you try to go for things in, um, uh, describe the same things in the same language. When you sort those skills, I have displayed these uh, horizontally so you can see them, um, but you should work in two columns only like this whole stuff here uh, because that's how Excel's tiny mind works. Um, so first you sort them and then you do something even more rudimentary, which is you count them. Um, and so when I did this exercise for myself, here's what I have done. If you look at how often I have used these skills, here is what I have done over the course of my career. The top things, clear written explanations, clear oral explanations, empathy, customer service, data analysis, personnel management and development, and understanding organizational expectations. Those are the things I have used most commonly throughout my career, and you have all done them at different levels because I am more senior, um, but you have all done them and you should uh, be confident that these are things that can help you in your job search. So this exercise, you know, I don't know, six to eight to 10 hours um, and very well done uh, with a friend or with a sibling or both. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen again and I'm going to go back to the presentation. Share, job search, share. Okay, and we're gonna, not going to put you through all that again and we are going to scroll down. Um, okay, so this template exercise should help you remember information and it should enable you to define, sort, and count your skills. Now, once you have done it, your next job is to create a resume from that data. Now, how do you do that and how do you make a resume and not a CV? I said to you earlier that your message to a non-academic employer is, my skills can help solve your challenges. Your resume's message is, my skills can help solve your challenges. Here's proof. So what you do in a resume is you highlight critical supporting information. You describe what you were responsible for and key skills you used, and you describe outcomes with measured results where that is possible. And I'll show you what to do where there aren't uh, precise quantitative measurements. So, now we're going to look at my resume, um, and I'm going to stop sharing again. Stop share, share, and Crook resume, share. Uh, Laura, can you confirm for me that you can see the resume? Yep, I see it. Okay, super. So first things first, um, uh, at the very top, your name, you should have an email address. Uh, you should have the one that you are most likely to answer. Uh, I recommend that you have a non-academic email address. Um, you should have a short URL for your LinkedIn. Uh, you should have the phone number that you are most likely to answer or respond to. Uh, 
Uh, and I very strongly recommend that women not have their full snail mail addresses uh, on their resume. Uh, there's a lot of skeevy people out there, uh, and uh, I don't think that information needs to be visible. You do need to have some indication of where you are. Uh, and what the assumptions people are going to make on the basis of that information are the following. They are going to assume that if you are in the United States, that that is where you are being trained. And they are going to assume, justifiably or not, um, that you are eligible to work in the United States. So it is very important that you, if you, for example, are eligible to work in, in say, let's say you have a US and an EU passport, that under uh, where it says Seattle, Washington, that's where you would have a line that said, eligible to work in the United States and Europe, for example. But that is the base information you have to have. So then you have a summary, and the summary highlights your best skills. Uh, and uh, I know it will shock you to hear sometimes that people do not read absolutely everything put in front of them. So it is very important that your first sentence is a good lead sentence and highlights your best skills. So here it is. Founder, owner, and principal of Practical Workplace Advice, consulting with university, foreign nonprofit clients across the United States and Canada, teaching graduate students how to find non-academic jobs and organizations, how to help women employees succeed and thrive. If you read nothing else about me, you would know what I do. And that is what that summary paragraph is for. And then I, you know, I go into a little more detail. Um, then you have uh, professional experience in reverse chronological order. Um, and uh, I want to highlight um, a couple things. If you scroll down to where uh, what I did when I was a just a member and not the chair of the board of directors, um, look at the two paragraphs under there. As member, board of directors, responsible for reviewing and approving organizational mission and vision, policies, strategies, and budget of Lambda Legal, executive strategic planning and audit committees, search committee for CEO, chair of technology subcommittee for development. And then as leader of Seattle leadership team, responsible for Seattle Garden Party, annual fundraiser netting in excess of $300,000. That last sentence is the kind of sentence I want you to be able to write. It is, here's what I did, here's what I was responsible for, and here's the outcome. Now, the numbers are going to be different for you because they're probably going to be a little smaller because you're at earlier stages of your career. But it is that kind of thing that I want you to be able to say. Now, um, you notice that this is a this is a volunteer board. Um, you notice I have not labeled it with the scarlet V for volunteering. Um, and this is something that you do not need to do. When you do volunteer work, uh, you don't have to label it V for volunteering because I don't care where people get skills if they get them from paid work um, or volunteer work. So now, one thing I want to do is in this resume, I want to scroll down to where I was um, as a faculty member because there are some instructive things about this. So uh, you should uh, be looking at the bottom left hand page there. So when I was a faculty member uh, as an assistant professor and I did undergraduate and graduate teaching and PhD candidate supervision, so placed PhD candidates as assistant professors at Harvard, Penn, and Bradley, co-supervised a PhD who won the university-wide dissertation prize. So again, what I did, what I was responsible for, and outcomes. Um, and then finally, uh, this interesting one on the top right. Faculty supervisor of graduate student journal turned it from dysfunctional mess into respected publication, efficiently produced. This is the sentence that got me my interview at Amazon.
not the job, but the interview. And the reason is, this is the sentence where I described what work is. I came on a situation, I found it at a certain level, and I turned it into something else. Now, the other thing is, several people have commented on the tone here about, it, about a little bit of snark. And I could use this tone um, because I was applying in technology. Now, if I were applying to a white shoe law firm, uh, I would not use this kind of language. So, you know, there is such a thing as judgment involved when you put together a resume. Um, but the final thing uh, before I give a couple sort of concluding remarks and then take your questions about resume, I want to say is this. I recently sent this resume to a friend um, whose husband uh, is looking for work. And he opened it up on his monitor and he read it and then he shouted to his wife, oh my God, Teresa, come look at this. And then she read, he read that sentence to her and she said, yep, that's Anne. And what I want you to do over time, and it's gonna take a little time to get there, I want you to be able to write the sentence that is, yep, that's you. And you will do it if you think about yourself more broadly and you think about, um, you think about what, what makes you you and how those skills are going to be valuable to an employer. Um, and then finally, uh, just a couple remarks more. Uh, education and languages, uh, and I'll address specifically the PhD question, but as you can see, it's on here. It's toward the bottom. Um, people uh, with PhDs often want to put their education at the top. Um, I, I tend to discourage that uh, unless you're applying specifically to a very small number of academic jobs. Um, there used to be a sentence at the bottom of resumes um, called uh, res uh, references available on request. Uh, people assume that and you do not need to have it. Uh, there's also sometimes a section uh, variously called hobbies or what I do when I'm not working. Uh, sometimes that is relevant and sometimes that is not, uh, but it is not required. Um, but let me uh, turn it over to Laura for questions, and I want to open by addressing the question about length of resume. Lots of people ask me about this, um, and I have two answers. One is that I do not have religion about the length of resumes, and the reason is you are going to be submitting your resume very often online. You are going to be cutting and pasting and put it into online um, forms and it will not matter as much how long it is. So by the way, pro tip, always, always, always have a text unformatted version of your resume in one long sheet because you're gonna be cutting and pasting forever. Um, but the second, so that's, so that's, I don't have religion about length, but here's the thing I do have religion about. If you are asked for a one page resume, you must turn in a one page resume. If you are asked for a two page resume, you must turn in a two page resume. In other words, if people ask you to do a task, do that task. Because if they ask you for one page and you send three, they will take that uh, as a very bad sign of the kind of employee you're likely to be. Um, so Laura, let me uh, ask you to uh, send me questions. We have a lot of questions here. Um, <clears throat> I am going to start with the questions that got upvoted, the ones that were more common questions. Um, regarding your comment about how to justify the decision to spend one's time doing a PhD, what is a good way to do this? What kind of language would make sense to an employer? The kind of language that makes sense to an employer is the language relevant to their job. So if they are looking for a job <clears throat> analyzing data, one of the things, what you say is, the reason I'm interested in your job is that my training has taught me to take large data sets and look for relevant patterns, for example. That's what you're looking for in your job. So the question is not the PhD per se. 
It is not about the credential. It's about the elements of the things that you have learned that are relevant to the employer's job. You have to shift the center of gravity from you to the employer. Um, a question about location. For location <clears throat> on the resume, what should someone do if they're currently in Ann Arbor but planning to move elsewhere? This the person who asked that they're moving to Oregon after they graduate and they want to find jobs there. And we had several people upvote that. So, um, so it depends on how long um, it is going to be between now and the move. Uh, if it's going to be six weeks, go ahead and put the new place on. If it's going to be six months or a year, don't. And the reason is, is that the employer employers are going to make an assumption about getting you out for a visit right for an interview and if they have to fly you out that's a different decision than if they can ask you to drive to portland right so you need to clarify that for employers yeah that's great um we have a question i worked for eight to ten years between my undergraduate degree and entering my phd program with a master's mixed in i'm not sure if i'll be looking at jobs in the same field i used to be in how do i simultaneously account for both a quote career change field change and a six-year gap being the phd and we have several people who upvoted that so lots of folks in a similar situation so first of all it's not a gap it is work that you did where you gain skills so there's two ways to address this you can write a resume that instead of being reverse chrono is organized by skill set so data analysis teaching you know customer engagement you can absolutely do that and then within those sections you do reverse chronological of all the ways you have done that um, you can alternatively, which I think is more common, you can show the things you did in reverse chronological order, but focus on the skills within them. Again, this is the thing where it is not about the degree as, as such. It is about what you worked on and how it is relevant to an employer. And that's why I say uh, these, these periods where you worked is not a gap. It's a different venue where you use skills. And I want to particularly address um, the issue um, for women who sometimes have been, um, have had periods where they were focused on raising children. Um, I love hiring parents, especially mothers of young children, because they use half an hour better than any other person I know. And what you have to describe is what you did when you were learning. Um, and I have a blog post that has some examples of that. Um, but one uh, person who got hired uh, spent a lot of time uh, raising money to uh, redo the equipment on her two young children's playground. Um, and she is an awesome multitasker and an awesome budget person. She is a terrific project manager and that's what I hired her to do. And she had been out of the workforce for three years. So, you know out of the paycheck workforce, I should say. She had been working like a dog. So go ahead. Um, one person has spoken to four or five consulting firms that recommended that they not have a summary, but instead list skills directly under their experiences. And this was especially true when trying to keep the resume to one page, which many um, of these consulting firms recommend. Um, so the question here was, when do you recommend using a summary versus not? Okay, so two, uh, there are sort of two answers to that. If you look at where uh, I have under International Program Manager, you'll see I have a mini summary and bullet points. Um, and what I recommend is that you use prose or a mini summary for describing responsibilities and you use bullet points for describing achievements. So I'm going to go back up. So sorry if it makes you a little queasy as I scroll. Um, so I think it is good to have a summary um, for describing complex problems. Because achievement, what achievements often don't do, particularly if they are disparate, um, is show uh, the link between disparate kinds of work. Um, 
But again, you should produce the kind of resume that you get asked for. Now, another thing to note is that some fields have uh, conventions. So particularly in computer science, um, in computer engineering, you will find that it is customary to have instead, you have a very brief summary, but uh, it is customary instead to have a bulleted list of the computer languages you work in. So you do need to do some research around fields. Um, this is for um, a sort of corporate uh, resume that is not necessarily technical, but is managerial. Okay. And how does one talk about activities and skills that one has developed during a PhD program that don't have a title for it, like teaching assistants? So for example, the work that one did taking preliminary exams for candidacy, for instance, making reading lists, attending several meetings with committee members, indexing, et cetera. Okay, so that is where, uh, so I've talked a little bit about that in the past and I will talk a little bit about it more in the rest of this presentation. But what you have to do is you have to describe those activities in terms that make sense to an employer's. So preparation for qualifying exams is not a term employers generally engage with, but doing data and field assessments is an appropriate term. Um, so schedule planning, uh, so writing a syllabus is not uh, a term that employers typically engage with, but project planning is a skill. So what you need to do is you need to learn the uh, non-academic nearest equivalents uh, for the kinds of things you have done as a graduate student. But on the resume, you should use language that makes sense to an employer. Do you have a recommendation of where to find a list of skills to help folks identify what a skill might be? Um, this person says they have problems verbalizing what they think their skills are. Sure. Uh, so the most efficient way to do that, and I talk about this a little bit later, the most efficient way to do that is to reverse engineer it by reading job descriptions look at what employers are asking for, and then you sit down with people and you talk about those skills, and then they say, oh, here's what this means. So that's how you figure it out. Is it worth listing your publications on your resume? If they are directly relevant to the job for which you are applying. Um, one person says, your work experience seems easily divided into work categories, but since I don't have that many work experiences, but I have lots of skills under my graduate student work experience, how do I think about that? I've always divided my grad student work experience into different projects I've worked on. Is that the right way to go? Uh, it depends on what job you're applying for. If you are applying for a job that is, a, for example, about project management, and you can talk about projects that go from end to end, then yes, it is. If you are applying for a job that asks you to use your skills at various projects, then you may want to have a skills-based resume. But again, it's not about only how you think about yourself. It is how you think about yourself relevant to the work you are applying to do. Okay, one, we, more one more question and then okay. I'm gonna go ahead on. We have one that um, three people have voted. I noticed that you put the date of your degrees which can signify age. Is that important? Do you worry about age discrimination? So several folks concerned about age discrimination. Uh, you absolutely should think about age discrimination um, because it is a thing. Um, but you should also put dates on there because honestly, with all the information available on the internet now, it's not like people can't find it out. And if you seem to hide it, that is worse. So what you have to describe if you are older is the skills and the uh, experience you bring. Because you get something different when you hire an older employee than when you hire somebody just out of undergraduate. Um, okay, I am going to stop sharing this and go back to the presentation. Um, share screen. Presentation, share. Ah, this time uh, it did not go back to the beginning. Excellent. Laura, can you confirm you can see my uh, presentation? I see it. Okay. 
All right. So you have now, you have developed, uh, you have changed your attitude toward the workplace. You have developed a, a mini database of skills. You have put them in the resume. And now you have to broaden the pool of people you reach out to for help. This is a big change. Only a few people can help you get an academic job, but many people can help you get a non-academic job. So you have to assemble a pool of people who can help you reach out to others. Personal contacts help you find out what a job advertisement really means. So in this, I am answering the question of that person who asked, you know, how do I learn to define my skills? Uh, this is one of the ways you do it. Also, personal contacts help resumes not get lost in a pile. So LinkedIn is the current tool. Uh, it, is a, it provides databases of companies, jobs, and people. Uh, so you can research organizations. It helps you ask for introductions to people you don't know through people you do know. This is its core function. LinkedIn is six degrees of Kevin Bacon for the workplace. So you should use LinkedIn to make your resume available online and to create a group of people you know through whom you will reach out to others for information. It is very, very important that you make the transition from thinking of here is someone who can help me get a job, which is rarely true, to here is someone who can help me get information, which is almost always true. So to create your own pool of contacts. You invite people you know to connect on LinkedIn. That's people in your own address book uh, and your own contacts. People LinkedIn recommends if you know them. So once you know you start doing it, uh, they will say, oh, do you also know this person? Uh, members of groups to which you belong. So you should join every alumni organization, <clears throat> every professional society, and every relevant club. People with whom you have interacted well. My dentist is on LinkedIn. She has a big practice uh, and I have a great relationship with my dentist. So she and I are on LinkedIn together. Now, here is where you will sometimes get very different advice. I assume all of us on LinkedIn have had those connections from people we don't know at all. I do not recommend uh, that you add these people. I want you to ask yourself, would I introduce her to someone I respect? Would I do him a favor? Because how LinkedIn is gonna work is it's gonna say, hey, Ann, I see you did some consulting work at Expedia. Um, would you help me? Um, I'm applying to their tax department. Would you introduce me to their VP of tax? And I have to put my credibility on the line by saying, sure, I'll introduce you to Rich Prem. Uh, and if I don't know that person, I'm not gonna do that. There is a sub use case of this um, when people ask to connect with you on LinkedIn and they say they are recruiters. Um, because I have a nasty suspicious mind, um, I don't say yes unless I know them because honestly anybody can say they're a recruiter. So LinkedIn, your contacts uh, are a core professional asset uh, and you've got to treat them that way. You've got to keep your contacts updated uh, and you have to bring them up to date. And that means a name, a private and or a work email address and a mobile phone number. And I'm, you know, I'm not talking about your holiday card list here. I'm talking about professional contacts. Uh, LinkedIn contacts are enough for purely professional connections. If you don't know them in any other way, that's fine. You should set a calendar reminder to invite new LinkedIn connections every week. And you should do two, like add two a week for the rest of your professional career. Back them up. Follow the rule of three. Um, you know, you, you can let LinkedIn back itself up, um, but you should have a local, a cloud, and an external backup device um, of your contacts. Okay. Uh, now I am going into the next major section of this, which is how to prepare yourself mentally for entering the non-academic job market. And then at the end of this, I'll take questions and then I will go into the mechanics of looking for a job. So first, a note about gender. 
This is what a guy does when he applies for a job. Uh, he applies if a job has six qualifications and he has three. He views job requirements as negotiable and desired ones as optional. And he routinely negotiates salary and benefits. This is what a woman does when she applies for a job. She does not apply if a job asks for six qualifications and she has five. Uh, she views job requirements as non-negotiable and desired ones as required. And she routinely does not negotiate salary and benefits. Gentlemen, keep doing what you're doing. Ladies, do not be this applicant. You are cutting yourself off from jobs that you can do um, and you are crippling your financial futures. Apply for the job and negotiate your salary and benefits. Uh, a note about starting over. This is closely related to the mentality that you're not using your degree anymore. Um, you will probably find yourself applying for some entry level jobs. Um, in my experience, people with PhDs will often be promoted faster, right? Because they're more mature and they're more experienced. This also goes to the comment about hiring older employees. What you are selling is who you are and your experience that you have. It is also the case that some non-entry level jobs, particularly one or two levels up, will be open to you if you describe your skills and your experience well. Now, you can start with an interim job. Find almost any job, you know, work at Home Depot. Um, and the reason for that is that having a job helps you present well in interviews. Also, the second most profound bias in the workplace um, after the bias against hiring pregnant women is that employers prefer to hire employed people. And very often people with PhD training are embarrassed to say, oh, I'm working at Home Depot. And if what you say is, oh, I'm working at Home Depot because nobody else will hire me, uh, I will join the group of people who will not hire you. Um, but if you say, I'm working at Home Depot because I wanted to learn about another industry, another boss and another supply chain, then I'm gonna be interested in hiring you because employers like to hire people who like to work. You can also start with temper contract work um, because what you're doing there is you are outsourcing the last mile of your job search. Um, you know, you learn about another company, industry, and a boss. Um, and, you know, you can do this work successfully long term. Um, and if you have child rearing responsibilities or a partner who works seasonally, um, sometimes contract work uh, is attractive. You can also uh, relocate in some ways, because if you have, if you work for a contract firm that has multiple offices, sometimes they can help you move. A uh, couple things about the four uh, nonprofit and uh, public sectors. Uh, there is a common misconception that if you leave academic-based research uh, for for-profit work, that you will have less intelligent colleagues and less intellectually demanding work. Uh, if you think this, I hope you conceal it well, um, because nobody wants to be your intellectual sloppy seconds. Uh, I have never worked at a more intellectually challenging place uh, than Amazon. Uh, nonprofit work. Um, sometimes people think that it is easier to get a nonprofit job than a for-profit job without relevant experience and skills. It's actually the reverse because nonprofits um, uh, have less money, fewer resources, uh, and they, it is for them, hiring mistakes are really hard. So very often they are going to be more stringent about requirements um, than uh, for-profits. Uh, sometimes uh, people in academics believe that people in nonprofits are better motivated uh, than those in for-profit or public sector jobs. Uh, again, that has not been my experience. Um, and sometimes people believe that lower material rewards, you know, in nonprofit sectors where salaries are often lower, that it'll be compensated for by more rewarding, more rewarding work. And I have found that this is not a function of the work. This is a function about the attitude that you bring to it. 
So the people at Lambda Legal who do accounts payable and the people at Amazon who do accounts payable are doing the same job. And if their attitude is different, then that's, you know, that's a question for them. Um, but it is not because the work is different. It's about how they conceptualize their environment. So it's just, it's important for you to do that, um, that mental research for yourself. Now, some things about the public sector. Um, hiring requirements may be more rigid, and this is because they are often set down in statute. Um, it is possible that compensation and benefits are not negotiable, also in statute. Um, your salary may be publicly available. Uh, this is something I learned at the University of Michigan, where my salary was published uh, because I was a public employee of the state of Michigan. Uh, and I have to say, initially, it sort of creeped me out, but I came to like it. And I came to like it because information benefits people with less power. And at the University of Michigan, salary differentials between men and women doing the same job were lower than at many other places. And that's because the data was publicly available. And I encourage you to like publicly available data. Uh, if you're in the public sector, your comments about your job on social media, not all your comments, but your comments about your job may be regulated. Um, and finally, uh, a note, uh, I hope everyone listening to this call will consider running for office one day um, because not enough people with graduate training do that. Uh, and I recommend that you shadow a, a campaign or volunteer um, because I hope uh, everybody with graduate training will think about public service. Um, some final thoughts about handling the slog. You know, you guys are all here because you have done well. You have done well in high school, which is why you got into college. You have done well in college, which is why you got into your graduate program. Your job search is going to have a ton of disappointments. Uh, great sounding jobs that get filled just before you apply. You know, not stuff that gets acknowledged. Phone screens that aren't very many and not very many interviews and fewer job officers. Rejection is normal not a sign that you are failing. Um, there's an article I think you all should read by a faculty member from Arizona State University, um, Devoni Lucer, Me and My Shadow CV, and it is about what her CV would look like if it had the failures uh, as well uh, as her successes. Uh, and I think it really, really helps contextualize um, the job search. Okay. Um, before I go on to talk about non-academic job search mechanics, uh, Laura, let me ask you if there are questions particularly related um, to the sort of psychological preparation for the job search. Um, let me skim again. I think we have a lot that are more logistic and resume related. Okay. I'm going to get to them. All right, let me start the logistics and the mechanics, and then the stuff I didn't get to, we can do at the end. How does that sound? Sounds good. Sorry, I already no muted worries. myself. No worries. All right, I'm going to talk about the mechanics of the job search, job postings, hiring managers, and the logistics. So job postings, uh, here's all the things I'm going to talk about. So most job searches start online. Uh, you can constrain your search geographically. You constrain it by field or job type. You can constrain it by network. Um, here is something you should not do. Um, because there are relatively few academic jobs, but the path to them is straightforward, um, graduate students apply for everything for which they are conceivably qualified. Um, you cannot do that with non-academic job searches because there are too many. Um, and so don't throw spaghetti at the wall. This is how successful job searches start. It is not where they end up, but you take a set of keywords describing what you do best and you constrain it within some geography. That's how the search starts. Um, you can also find them by looking for companies, nonprofits, and public sector services you either admire or want to improve. In other words, 
search for the organization rather than the job. You can search for publications about places you would like to live. Search for places rather than the job. One of the things about non-academic job search is that it is much less constrained by geography, so you can, you know, make more decisions about where you want to live. And then for international students, you should look for companies from your home country that do business in the U.S. and vice versa. Um, your embassy or your consulate can help because those are the companies that have strong vested interest uh, in your joint preparation. Now, here is a really underappreciated thing, which is who writes job descriptions? Um, the hiring manager or somebody in human resources or the last person to hold the job? Here is the important thing. The person who you will be directly working for um, has not always written the job description. So a personal contact at the organization is your best source of information about what the job description really means. Another slightly strange fact, who are job descriptions for? You believe you know, it is for internal and external candidates and that is absolutely true but it is also indirectly for the hiring manager's boss and finance to like prove that the position is needed. Applicants aren't the only audience for the job description. Again, this is why I stress so much personal contacts at the organization, because you wanna find out what the job description really means, right? Uh, so this gets back to the question I got earlier about how to describe skills. You gotta read a lot of job descriptions to learn their jargon. Uh, and I link in the presentation to blog posts I wrote about how to do that. But you gotta read a lot of job descriptions. And then you have to learn the academic nearest equivalents for the required and requested skills. And that's that slide I did at the beginning about how you start to learn to describe yourself differently. You have to ask friends in those types of work to help you understand the job descriptions. And what is communication skills required? Oh, you have to be able to present to the boss and customers, all those kinds of things. And then, this is one of the best ways to learn. You ask organizations that have posted interesting job descriptions if you can have informational interviews. And sometimes those are with HR and sometimes those are with people in the particular discipline. But what they say is, hey, you say communication skills, who are the primary audiences you need us to talk to? You talk about data analysis, tell me, a, you know, what's the most difficult data problem you guys are solving at the moment? Um, you learn to read job descriptions by reverse engineering, which is basically you read a ton of them and you ask about them, lather, rinse, repeat. Here's how you use your LinkedIn contacts. Let's say you find a job description you want to know more about and you troll through LinkedIn and you find someone either with that kind of job, someone who worked at that place, or a connection. And here is what you say. Hey Anne, I see somebody you know worked at this place I'm interested in. Would you be willing to answer some kind of questions or introduce me to that person? This is the core function of LinkedIn. And of course, it obviously works for anybody not on LinkedIn. But this is what you do. You find something you're interested in and you use LinkedIn to get yourself better information. This is how you learn about job descriptions. And this is a long process. And so this is why I say that if you, let's say you're doing a six month, a, a job search after your PhD and maybe it's gonna take six months. There's going to be three or four months of those up front where you're learning and doing research. The good thing is graduate students are good at research. Now, here is a very, 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 very important thing. There are no perfect candidates. Applicants have different skills in different degrees. All hires are compromises. If you like the job description and you don't have every required and desired skill, find out which are the key ones. If you can make a credible case that you have done that kind of work well, apply for the job. Women, you are socialized to take yourself out of consideration. 
re-socialize yourself to put yourself in the ring. If you like the job description and you can make a case that you have the skills for it, apply for the job. Do not give in to the myth of there are no perfect candidates. Somebody is better than me. It's like, yeah, but lots of people aren't as good as you too. So that was job descriptions. Now I'm gonna talk about hiring managers, uh, which is to say what they need and want and how they behave. How people like me behave when they hire people like you. Whoops, sorry about that. Hiring managers need somebody to solve problems for them, to handle the volume of work or to take on a new type of work. Notice it's about them and their job. So they are not thinking, I need a PhD. They are thinking, I need somebody to do this thing. Now, they want every skill they need, but believe me when I say they will take a subset. Some of those skills are in high demand, the job is hard, to fill, it's been open for a while, but above all, if the candidate is smart and willing to learn, the people I hire today are not going to be doing the same thing in 18 months. The workplace is changing too fast, uh, the job world is changing too fast, and jobs are changing too fast. I must have people who are smart and willing to learn. And that is something that you can say about yourself. Now, here is an important thing. They want the new person to start as soon as feasible or as soon as budgeted. And they are going to expect you to start not, you know, when you finish your dissertation or whatever, but really within a notice period. And that's typically two, two weeks or so. So it's important that you be aware of when you will be willing to start a new job. And so what you have to do, um, is uh, understand when you are going to finish uh, and plan to start your job search ahead of that. Now, this is how hiring managers behave. Um, they have an idea of the person and the skills they want, but they can be persuaded otherwise. When I go to hire, I think, ooh, I would love it if they could do X, Y, and Z and all this stuff. Um, but if you can make the case that you are the right person with the right skills, you can be hired. We all have ideals in our head, right? Because honestly, hiring is just like dating. <laughs> we all have an idea about what we want, um, but real human beings are different. They also, hiring managers also trust somebody who has worked at their company to refer candidates more than anybody else. This is why I encourage you to build up contacts and figure out how to reach out to people at companies to say, so I see this cool job and they say they want these 97 different things, but which of them really matter? And what are they really looking for? Um, because again, remember, the person who's doing the hiring is not always the person who has written the job description. Okay. Um, Laura, before I go on to uh, the actual logistics of the job search, are there any questions that are about job descriptions or hiring managers? Let me scroll down to the most okay. recent ones. Um, no, I know we have, we do have lots of other, you know, LinkedIn and contacts kinds of questions, but nothing specific to hiring managers. So we could probably save these for the end or. Okay. Okay, super. All right, then I will talk about logistics. Uh, then I have those brief slides at the end, but then we can answer a ton of questions. Okay, here are the things that you must do before you apply to any non-academic job. You must draft a resume, you have to get somebody outside of academics to critique it, revise it, and then you update LinkedIn with your reviewed and revised resume. If you already have a LinkedIn profile, don't worry about it. You don't have to take it down. Um, but just, you know, before you put something out there, make sure you get somebody with non-academic eyes to have a look at it. You must read lots of job descriptions. This is how you learn how people talk about what they're looking for. 
So not just what they're looking for, but what their language is. You have to look at your online presence and you have to be able to explain what's there. And that means blogs, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest. You have to do a vanity Google and you have to read three pages of results. Um, do not engage in the futile exercise of trying to erase the internet, um, but please do be able to explain what's out there. Uh, you have to revise or create a short writing sample uh, for intelligent, interested, non-specialist readers. Uh, there was a question earlier about grant writing, and this is a phrase I use constantly when I talk to academic audiences. Your new audience with the exception of a very few jobs, is intelligent, interested, non-specialists. I want you to do something like, you know, a proposal or a, a course description uh, or a description of an ac activity you've been involved in. Um, but unless they, uh, unless your employer asks specifically for something from your academic work, I generally advise against sending that, and it certainly has to be shorter. Please identify and clean your interview clothing. Um, if you can arrange a mock interview, uh, either with career services or with a friend, schedule a mock interview and dress for it. International students, you must be absolutely buttoned up about your visa status. You must know what it is, you must have documents for it, and you must know how long the various phases of it last. And you have to do all of this before you apply to anything. Here's the basic process. You find a job listing, you research the organization, you find a contact there if you can and discuss the job, you apply with a resume and a letter, you have a phone or a video interview, you have an in-person interview, you submit references and any supporting material, and you receive an offer and you negotiate it. Now, we have all heard the nightmare story of somebody who says, oh my God, Anne, I sent out 200 letters and resumes and I didn't get a single answer back. The people who have done that have not done the stuff in blue. Because again, throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping something sticks is not a great job search strategy. The first thing you have to do is find out if your skills are suited to the job. And that's why you have to do research and um, find a contact there and discuss the job. But that's the basic process. And now I'm gonna discuss the sort of pieces of it. So your first contact uh, is after you research the job type, the organization and the individual job, you write a job letter that is tailored to the job, one-on-one. -on -one. All those people who have sent out 200 generic form letters um, are not getting answers because they don't seem to be putting the effort into researching the job. You submit a resume that is suited to the job. Most people have about three resumes. You know, they have the, res let's say, the if they're a chemist, let's say they have the research job, they have the bench job, they have the public science job, and maybe the grant uh, um, grant writing resume. Um, so you submit a letter that is one-on-one, -on -one, you submit a resume that is suited to the job, and your LinkedIn profile must support your letter and resume. Um, it has to be credible, but a lot of people have a lot of different interests, and so what you do on LinkedIn is you just put the thing that you are most interested in at the top. So pro tip, um, most people, most employers will read either the letter or the resume, but not both equally carefully. So make sure that the letter or your resume could stand on its own if they need to. Here's what interviewers usually do. They look at your LinkedIn profile and see if they know anybody. They Google your name. They read your job letter and or your resume, but not equally carefully. They ask around to find out if anybody knows you personally. And they review your writing or your work or your code sample. So that's what an interviewer is typically going to do. So here's what you need to do for phone, video, and in-person interviews. 
they prepare, you have to prepare at least three questions for your screener or your interview. One each about the job, the company, and the location. This shouldn't be hard. And if you don't do at least as much research about the job to be able to do this, there is no reason for them to take you seriously. Um, so for phone and video, you may be asked to use one of the current platforms. Uh, if that's not a platform you use all the time, make sure you download it and test it first. Uh, you should free your phone area from distractions, right? If you have posters that, you know, not everybody may love, or if you have uh, noisy roommates or noisy pets, uh, you know, ask career services if you can get some help for, um, uh, for uh, an area that's quieter to do a phone screen. Okay, this is very important. Don't stop your job search if you get a phone screen or an interview. Do not stop your job search until you are in your seat after orientation at your new job. When there are very few academic jobs and you advance in the stage, it is, it is tempting to focus and, um, and sort of rejoice in that and to narrow your focus. Don't do that. Um, stuff happens, right? Projects get canceled. You know, companies get acquired, senior people leave, and all of a sudden your boss can't take on your project. Don't stop your job search until you are at your desk. Um, when you interview in person, um, somebody's going to call to schedule it. Um, and you may ask the schedule about the interview standard of dress. Um, but if you forget, don't call the day before and ask. Uh, in that case, just dress business casual. Uh, if you are given the names of your interviewers, you uh, very often will not be, but if you are, do what they do, what I said they do. Look them up on LinkedIn and Google. Uh, you should bring a pad and pen, even if you usually take notes on a device. And the reason is a pad and a pen will lift your eyes about 10 degrees and it will help you look your interviewer in the eye. Uh, you should bring a hard copy of your references, names, and contact information. Uh, that should not, that information, that private data should not be on your resume, um, and you should wait to be asked to hand that information over. Uh, if you are not told when you can expect to hear back, you may ask at your last interview, which will either be with a hiring manager or HR or recruiting. Uh, after the interview, you should send a thank you note to the hiring manager. It should be professional, not fulsome in tone. Email is fine and a handwritten note is better. Um, I spend a lot of time as a volunteer raising money for Lambda Legal. And the single most powerful tool I have after Lambda Legal's good work is a handwritten thank you note. Uh, it is a skill that I strongly advise you to cultivate. Uh, if you have had good interactions with people who interviewed you, invite them to connect on LinkedIn and you can do this whether the hiring decision is positive or not because you never know <laughs> who you're going to work for. Um, and a good interaction is a good interaction. References. So this is something that works very differently than in academics. They are usually given by phone or submitted online rather than written ahead of time and distributed once. Uh, and here's a big thing that's different from academics. Uh, response time is shorter than for a reference for an academic job. You're gonna need three to five of them. Uh, the, the ref, your referees can be current research colleagues. Uh, one of them need not be your supervisor or PI. This is a big difference. Uh, in academics, you essentially cannot get an academic job or a postdoc without a strong recommendation from your thesis supervisor. Uh, in my world, references tend to be confirmatory rather than gatekeeping. It is helpful but not required if one referee can speak to your work in non-academic settings. Uh, you should make sure your resumes have the job description and your current resume. And uh, as I said before, references are less critical for non-academic jobs than for academic-based ones. Uh, I want to say something about your future as a hiring manager because everybody I'm speaking to 
uh, is going to be good at their jobs and going to be good in the workplace. Uh, and one day you are all going to be hiring people. I want you to remember today. I want you to remember being new to the job search. And I want you to remember being rejected. Um, and I want you to craft a courteous professional rejection. And I want you to send it as soon as it is appropriate. We all know how gross it is to apply for admission or a fellowship or a postdoc or something. And you don't get it, and you don't get it, and you don't get it, and you wonder if there's hope. That's awful. Um, and here's a thing that is way different from academics. Everybody you interact with may be or may refer your next great employee. Um, I want you to treat everybody courteously and professionally. And I want you to treat everybody as somebody who can contribute to your organization. Um, the golden rule is golden for a reason. And, and again, academics has this sort of thing where the people people respect tend to be, you know, tenured faculty members or people who bring in a lot of grant money, but, but relatively few people. And I want you to treat everybody well because you never know who is going to be your next great employee or who is going to tell somebody who is your next great employee. So um, here are the things I want you to do next. And then I'm going to shift to uh, Laura because I see we have lots of questions. Um, you should do the template exercise. You should update it once a year. Uh, initial exercise takes, I don't know, eight hours. And yearly updates are cake. They take half an hour in one session. You should join LinkedIn. You should add the people you know well and respect. You should do the template exercise and add the people it brings to mind. And you should create a calendar reminder to add two people a week forever. Um, don't add your resume until you have someone outside of academics review it. Um, you should create a non-academic email address if you don't have one, um, unless applying from your academic department is an advantage. Please, please, please do not create something like margaritamama at hotmail.com. Um, and you laugh, but you would not believe what has crossed my screen. Clean up your contacts uh, and keep them current. Please set a regular backup schedule for your contacts uh, and your files. Uh, I have some resources here for you. Uh, negotiating compensation. Careers in Gov. This is a quick way to learn about job listings and in the public sector. They post everything from entry level public service to data set manager for um, Calgary. The University of Michigan's Career Center uh, has one-on-one -on -one career counseling for graduate students. There's a link to make an appointment. Um, I have posts on the non-academic job search. And then, because I'm an academic, I have a book list. Uh, and these are books that I think will really help you um, in their various topics. Uh, I'm not going to go through each of these lists, but I have long lists of blog posts for the various um, aspects uh, of job searches. Now, before I go on to uh, reminders, whoops, go back, go back. Um, I want to, Laura, uh, I see we have tons of questions. I am certainly happy to hang out here, but why don't you just start from whatever looks good and then I'll answer questions for as long as people want to stay. Okay. Um, I am, I'm starting at the top, the ones that have gotten lots of likes um, okay. or upvotes. Um, what are some questions you should ask during the informational interview? You um, referenced earlier that you could request an informational interview if you see a, just, a job mm -hmm. description that really appeals to you. Mm -hmm. uh, the questions I always ask to find out are things like, um, what is the most important problem you're trying to solve? What is the hardest problem you're trying to solve? Who are your customers? Um, whose world are you changing? Those are really critical questions. Um, do you know any temp agencies that are particularly good at placing candidates with graduate education? Uh, the question isn't placing candidates with graduate education. The question is, temp agencies in particular fields 
and are you suited to those fields? Because a lot of temp agencies have specialties, right? They place, you know, people in finance or they place people in business or they place people in, in science research roles. So it's not about placing graduate students. It's about placing people in fields and jobs for which you are suited. That's why you have to do your work up front. I know you talked a little bit about timing and how soon before folks graduate with their PhD should they start applying for jobs and how do they tell the company that um, they're still in school but almost done? Um, so I tend to, I tell people that they should assume that a, a non-academic job search will take at least six months and that that four months of that should be research, which should which can obviously be done in conjunction with your academic work because you know you don't search for a job 24 hours a day. Um, once you go on the non-academic job market, you have to be prepared to start when the employer wants you to start or to turn down the job, right? Because an, some employers, uh, for example, um, employers who want you to do um, biometric research or chemical engineering research or things like that will want you to finish your degree. Um, but others um, may not be so understanding about it. So the really important thing you have to do is to have a handle on when you will be done. And then if an employer says, eh, I can't wait that long, that may be the answer. Um, but it is critical that you know and that you can answer credibly when you will finish. One, one person says, one of my biggest issues is once I have contacts, I don't know what to say to them to keep in touch and stay in their mind for when and if they hear of openings that may be relevant to me. Do you have any advice on that? How, how to keep your professional contacts um, having you in mind for opportunities? Um, you don't have to do that. Um, what you have to do is um, you have to let them know, uh, like when you when you engage with them, right? That you know I'm I'm on the job market. Um, you can absolutely write a general post uh, that you send out to LinkedIn contacts, saying, for example, uh, I wanted to let you all know uh, I am in the process of finishing my dissertation, which I expect will be done at time X. Um, I am currently looking for world uh, work in field Y. Um, I would value any expertise or insight that you have. Um, in the meantime, um, I very much appreciate your support uh, so far. You know, and that is enough to let people know that you are looking. Um, but generally, reaching out specifically is much, much more useful. It's a better use of your time and it's a better use of the person's time to whom you are reaching out. Because you should always reach out with a specific ask, not, you know, how the hell am I going to get a job? Because that is a, that is a question for your two best friends. That is not a question for professional contacts. We had a follow-up question about the job search timeline. Do you have any thoughts about um, adjusting how early people should be applying given the current time of pandemic. Um, I know you had said roughly six months. Do you think the current climate is any different than that recommendation, Anne? No, I don't. Um, because the, uh, per, first of all, we don't know, we don't know anything about this pandemic. We don't know how long it'll last. We don't know if there's going to be another wave. We don't know when and if there's going to be a vaccine. I mean, we just don't know enough, right? So what you should do is focus on the things you can control. And the things you can control are defining your skills, writing a resume and a high level cover letter based on those skills, learning about jobs, learning their jargon, uh, and applying for jobs for which you are suited. That is what you can control and that is what you should do. We have a question that is quite popular. How can you acquire personal contacts at an organization outside of your network when you don't have any possible connection on LinkedIn? What about cold emailing? Um, I find that uh, not very helpful. You can always do informational interview requests 
at organization where you don't have contacts. And what you do there is you go through the person listed as the uh, hiring manager, or you go through HR or the um, recruiters. Um, but do not underestimate your contacts. You should, of course, add everybody you respect in your program and everybody you know in graduate school. You should also add like all your undergraduate friends. You should go back to high school and add the people you have worked with. You should add vendors you have worked with. You know more people than you know, and they know more people than you know. So if you don't know somebody at a place that you would like to be considered for, that's when you go the informational interview route. Um, but start building up your contacts and you must crack out of the mentality of, oh, it's the people in my program who can help me. Tons of people who can, tons of people can help you. In uh, response to your point about even if you don't have all the qualifications, whether or not to apply to a position, if a company has multiple job openings at different levels, how do you know which level to apply for? And the example they gave us, senior scientist one versus senior scientist two, et cetera. So what you should do is you should read the job descriptions and you should see where they are differentiated. And that is a case where what I would try to do ideally is to talk to somebody who holds those jobs um, and talk to somebody in your department, for example, and say what the different and find out what the difference is. But that is a case where I would feel very comfortable at calling their HR or their recruiters and saying, you know, there are two different uh, jobs here. Um, I have the qualifications. I just want to understand what the right level is. That's a totally legitimate question. A uh, one person asked, but five other people have um, liked this question. For applicants of color or other minority groups, what are things we need to be looking out for? Should we put information about our race slash ethnicity on our resumes? Um, I would not put it on your resumes. Um, there is differing advice about whether you should have a photo on LinkedIn. Um, some people believe that that uh, triggers unconscious bias in hiring. Um, but it is worth Googling yourself and images and seeing how easy it is for someone to find a photo of you. Because if it is easy for someone to find a photo of you, um, then, you know, you may want to get a decent headshot and put that on LinkedIn. So they're looking at that and not necessarily whatever's out there in, in the world of Google. Um, for applicants of color, I think it is particularly important that you network. Because in addition to everything else you want to learn about an organization, you want to learn if the organization has a good track record of hiring and promoting and retaining employees of color. Um, because some, app, some uh, organizations have a good pub, pipeline up front, but then don't invest in their professional development. Some uh, organizations uh, hire very well, but then don't retain them well. Uh, and all of those are things you want to know ahead of time. It is incredibly important for people who are in any underrepresented group that you network as thoroughly and well as you can. Um, so I guess that's what I would say about that. Thanks. And you've referred to data and data analysis a number of times. Can you explain what counts as data? This question's coming from a fellow English trained person, but we've had uh -huh. five people who like the question. So, uh -huh. so um, what I understand as data is perhaps uh, a little broader than how some people describe it. Uh, it is possible, for example, to think of a data set as, for example, um, all anonymized income tax returns from Pennsylvania for 10 years. That's a data set. Um, another data set uh, or another set of data um, is all the representations of women in 18th century literature and how they change from the first two decades of the century to the latter two decades of the century. That's a data set. What I'm really interested in is how people look at a large body of information, how they synthesize it, how they analyze it, and how they draw conclusions from it. 
that at a, at a really high level, that's how I think about graduate school and graduate training. And so I'm really interested in how people talk about data, how they conceptualize it, do they like it, do they like wrestling with it, and what happens when they run into a weird new data set they've never seen before. I care a lot about how people think about that stuff. Regarding the interim job and employers preferring those who are already employed, what about freelancing or self-employment after the PhD? Would that be better, equal, or worse than the Home Depot or contract work scenarios you gave? Um, it's a terrific supplement. And if it's more closely related to the job you're looking for, so much the better. Um, in my experience, people often do both. Um, and they do both because, you know, Home Depot brings in a little more money in a little more reliable way. Uh, for those of you who are interested in this option, at the end of my PDF of these slides, I have a whole section on uh, going solo for yourself. I don't go over it because only a subset of people want to see it, but it will be, but the advice for that will be there in the slides. And I will send those slides uh, by the end of the day today. We had an earlier question about who should do a postdoc, um, but we have an additional one. Okay. Um, this person asks if they want to move into consulting or an MSL, which I think is medical science mm -hmm. liaison position, mm -hmm. should they do a postdoc? Um, the question is how relevant it is to where you want to be. Um, I do not advise doing postdocs to mark time. Um, because you know we've all seen the scary statistics about people who get a PhD and then do three consecutive postdocs and wake up at you know 42 with not being paid very well and no retirement savings and that's no good. Um, where postdocs are really helpful is especially if they are at another institution. If they're at another institution or a, another kind of workplace and it, it helps expand your work or if it helps you do a subspecialty in new techniques or research methods that you have not been exposed to, um, or it helps you gain supervisory skills, um, those are great reasons to do postdocs. Um, so it depends on you know, how it helps you branch and how it helps you grow. Because the key thing is that the postdoc should help you as much as it helps the people for whom you're working. Right. Um, we've had a couple of questions from international um, scholars. Could you say a few things about employers' approach toward applications from non-U.S. citizens? The Excel sheet makes me think that all the experiences that come along with being an international student would be positively projected on the resume. Still, there are migration-related issues that can affect employers' judgment. Totally. Well, and it's not just affecting employers' judgment, it's affecting their budget, right? Because, because when employers have to help employees like apply for visas or apply for green cards, I mean, the green card process is very expensive and very time consuming. Um, so what you have to do as an international student is you have to know your visa status, you have to know how long you can be in a particular place, and you have to have documentation to prove it. And then when an employer asks you, um, you have to uh, talk about that honestly. Um, but yeah, you, but a lot of your experiences are incredibly valuable. Live, uh, I look for people who live in multiple countries and who have passports. Because when I worked in international at Amazon and I sent people abroad, they had to represent themselves and the country and the company and me. So international experience is incredibly valuable. Also, um, a multilingual experience, very valuable. We have a question, very basically, what title and date range do you give to, quote, being a graduate student for time when you are not a research assistant or a TA slash GSI? And um, also, can slash should you include a description within the education section of the resume? By description. So I'm guessing this means like if someone has a grant, um, mm -hmm. you know, so they weren't necessarily employed as an RA or a TA for the full time of their degree. I see. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and go back to my resume. 
um, and show you what I'm uh, what I recommend there in Kruk resume share. Um, okay, so uh, so here's what I had uh, under education and languages. Cornell University PhD. Here's when I got it. Uh, awards, competitive fellowship awards. BAs, the languages I speak. So you notice I do not have a description um, of my PhD research. Now, I would have a description of my PhD research, but only if it were directly relevant to the job for which I was applying. That's great. Um, one person says, I am not confident about the skills I've learned in my graduate program. How do I know I have enough technical skills? Um, well, one answer is that there are never enough and you're never going to stop learning and everybody I hire is never going to stop learning. And I am also constantly running into skills I did not know I would need. Um, so what you have to do is you should never be confident that your skills are at their end state. What you should be confident of is here's the skill I have. Here's what I can currently do, and here's how I would plan to develop them to the next level. I mean, one of the th reasons I like hiring graduate students is they're often very good at describing how they plan to learn the next thing. I expect you to be able to do that as well. One person says they remotely mm -hmm. know someone at an organization they're applying to. Is it okay to reach out to them and let them know they're applying? Um, you should let them know you're applying, but a better reach out is, I have a, this specific question for you about the organization. You should, when you reach out to people, um, you should always reach out with a specific limited ask. Just not, like not anything you can tell me would be great. That may be true, but it is not helpful. One person says it might take me longer to finish a PhD if I do get a job. How do I communicate that to a hiring manager? Well, the only question is, is it relevant to a hiring manager? Because if you're applying to do a job, you're applying to do the job. And the fact that you're working on a PhD on the side either is or is not relevant. If it is relevant and if it's related to the job, then you're gonna have to say, um, here's when I expect to defend. If I take this job, here's when I expect to defend. Mm -hmm. um, but if it is not relevant to the job, it's not relevant to the employer. It's, it's not your employer's job to care about when you finish your PhD unless it's relevant to the job. I see one person says, I've heard commonly that you should wait if you are in the interviewing process. Um, I think this was when you were talking about and um, maybe adding the person as a contact on LinkedIn. Um, ah. But this person says, largely, largely because it may burn the bridge, it seems you suggest otherwise. Have you had experience with numerous offers and how that may impact relationship with the company that you denied? Oh, oh so maybe I, this was right, more about, right. you know, to keep interviewing. Right, so the key thing is, to identify the job you want and not to assume that you have that job until your butt is in that seat. So that's the first thing. And that means you keep your job search going until that stage. Now, if you get two competing offers at the same time, which is I think what this person is asking, um, what you have to do is do research and understand which of those jobs you most want and negotiate with that as the lead person. And that's when you say, um, you know, that's when you negotiate salary and so on and so forth. And then what you want to do is when you tell the other person that you are not taking a job, uh, it, their job, it is very important to understand the rules if there are any in this state about whether you need to tell them um, that where you are, where the other job is that you are taking. Um, and the reasons why. But you, uh, the golden rule applies. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Uh, if you say, you know, the third person I spoke to in the interview seemed like an idiot, right? That's a bad way to approach the issue. But if you say, uh, this other job, 
uh, offered a, a little more of work I'm immediately interested in doing, but I loved interviewing at your company and the people I talked to were great and smart and I appreciate the chance to do it. Can you suggest a bit of verbiage on how to craft a LinkedIn message to connect with jobs that you received a rejection for, but had a great interview with? So um, mm -hmm. any thoughts on that? So I assume it's, um, you want to stay in touch with the people who interviewed you and you say, uh, I'm very sorry, we won't be work colleagues, uh, but I really enjoyed interviewing you and just, you know, for future professional contacts and development, um, I would uh, appreciate the opportunity to stay connected with you on LinkedIn. We, uh, we have a question, um, would jobs at academic institutions that are not faculty, such as academic advisor, count as non-academic? I've <clears throat> often heard instead people talk about alternative academic or, um, but yeah, I don't know if mm -hmm. you have different thoughts on that, Anne. Um, I don't think it matters. I mean, sometimes they're called alt academic and sometimes the, uh, the degree is an advantage, but all the things I talk about in this presentation uh, about how to apply also apply to that group of, of uh, jobs. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Um, clarification regarding location on your resume. Do you recommend using the nearest big city or your specific location? I know you said earlier, and not to necessarily link link your exact home address. So do you have thoughts on whether it matters to list Ann Arbor versus Detroit versus Westland? No, I just, uh, just uh, I would say uh, where you live. I mean, it, you know, if you, if for example, you're a student at the University of Michigan and you lived in Ypsilanti, you might decide Ann Arbor rather than Ypsilanti just because Ann Arbor is so strongly associated with the university. And there are situations where that might be an advantage. Um, but otherwise, you know, just, just the city where you live is fine. Mm -hmm. If you find out who the hiring manager is, is it inappropriate to address them directly in an application? Uh, only if uh, it's appropriate if the hiring manager's name is listed um, on the um, on the job description. Mm -hmm. If you have found it out in some way, then no. Then you say um, to the hiring manager, colon, or something like that. Um, one person says, but two other folks have agreed. I am good, a good public speaker and teacher, but with one-on-one -on -one interviews, I think it generally goes badly and I come across as overly nerdy and dry with no personality. Any tips on how to improve this or should I just be looking for jobs that value this kind of person? Uh, you should look for all jobs to which your skills are suited. Now, the way you improve interviews is the way you improve playing the clarinet or dribbling a soccer ball or making biscuits from scratch, which is practice. And so if you feel you are not interviewing up to, you know, the level of your skills, then have practice interviews. Um, I do think that one thing that really, really helps interviewing is changing how you conceive the person to whom you are talking. In graduate school, as you go through your graduate work, you work with a smaller and smaller group of people who are more and more specialized until you get to speak a language that is unique to that group and that specialty. And if you put together a writing sample that is for interested, intelligent, non-specialists, then working on talking to that audience will help you talk to people in interviews. Because what you do when you're nervous is you revert to the language of which you are comfortable. And the language on which you are currently comfortable is hyper-specialized graduate student geek. That's what we all do. Um, I am encouraging you to develop a different language that is for interested, intelligent non-specialists. Do you, this is a quick one, do you see value in paying for LinkedIn Pro? No. Succinct. Um, how would you recommend highlighting DEI work that many of us, uh, many of us do naturally as teachers at UM slash 
are able to engage with us scholars in the humanities. So diversity, mm -hmm. equity, and inclusion yep. work. Yep. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to describe specific instances of it, whether it is counseling or uh, whether it is uh, advising student groups. Um, and you have to talk about the skills that you bring to it. Um, and how you want to use that in the workplace if it is relevant to the employer. A question regarding informational interviews and asking for one with organizations who posted a job description for a position that interests you. Is it okay to ask for this informational interview if it's a job you actually want to apply to? Absolutely. And in fact, it's better to do so because the more information you get about it and the, you know, the more of a vibe you get about the people who work there and about the language they use, all information is good information. Also, when you get the informational interview, the job you think was the job you really wanted may turn out to not be the job you really want at all. And mm -hmm. that's, even, that's even more valuable because then you don't spend time on it. Um, we have a couple of people who asked why not use an academic email address. One person said, that seems more professional than a personal email address? Um, it depends. Um, when you use uh, like a Gmail address, for example, which you know lots of people have these days, um, it is a, a sort of a neutral thing. Um, an academic email address may be an advantage, um, but the, the signal uh, it may send unbidden to an employer is that, oh, they really want to stay there, or that's the information they like, or they've built up all of that side of themselves, but they haven't paid attention to the other side. Uh, it can be more professional, but um, I strongly advise people to have uh, an email address that is something like, you know, first name dot last name some number at gmail.com mm -hmm. or something like that. Can you talk about working with a recruiter rather than directly applying to posted jobs? Yeah. So to work with a recruiter, the recruiter has to have some reason to work with you. There are lots of people applying for entry level jobs. Um, but what recruiters do is they typically fill relatively specialist needs for companies. So if you have a specialized skill set, like you are working in, um, for example, currently, if you are working on synthesizing vaccines currently, and there are a bunch of um, drug companies who want, want your skill set, um, I can absolutely imagine working with a recruiter. Um, but going out and finding yourself a recruiter at an entry professional level uh, can be hard. Because it is, it, you know, it's not clear to me what a recruiter would bring at the entry level that you would not bring unless you have a specialized skill set. Mm -hmm. Would a research postdoc ever overqualify someone for an, a non-research, non-academic job, assuming a PhD has not already overqualified them? Would a postdoc uh, ever hurt or would it only help? Okay, I'm about to rant. <laughs> um, there is no such thing as being overqualified. If you are having a conversation about being overqualified, you are having the wrong conversation. The conversation cannot be about qualifications, postdocs, PhDs, anything like that. The qualification has to be about your suitability for the job for which you are hiring. If they say to you, well, you know, you have all this experience and, you know, I could certainly get somebody with a BA, uh, you don't engage with that. What you engage with is, here's why I'm interested in your job. I've done this research that's directly applicable, and I am interested in solving the kinds of problems you're addressing for the kinds of people you're solving this problem for. If you are having a conversation about being overqualified, you are having the wrong conversation. And I so rant about this that one of those blog posts, I'm going to change my screen share again, that one of those uh, blog posts I wrote is entirely about that. Um, because I answered that question um, um, nearly uh, all the time, apparently. So let's go down. Let's look at this. Let's make sure I... Uh, Anyway, there we go. 
Uh, there it is, number two, going on the job market and worrying about being overqualified, what that means. Okay, I'm gonna stop ranting now. You can ask me another question. Um, what elements make a strong cover letter? Um, clear prose, not over long, and clear relevance of your skills to the job for which you are applying and a clear statement of why you're interested in it. Um, do you have any thoughts about user experience UX research positions for academics, companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, more and more academics I know are applying for these jobs. I interviewed for a position, interviewed well, but was not offered due to a shift in business direction with COVID. I was told they would get in touch if things changed. Any advice on whether to follow up with the company in the future or move on? So there's sort of two questions yeah, um, in this one question. <clears throat> yes, so the answer to follow up is definitely. And, you know, follow up about two or three months later and then say if, you know, if it's too soon and if you don't know and if there's a, an appropriate interval to follow up, follow up. But in general, I would advise following up on somebody uh, if somebody could not hire you roughly every three months or so um, because you know un units of a quarter of a year are often how companies plan mm -hmm. uh, and what i think about ux jobs is i think they're fabulous jobs for um, uh, people with academic training because they they rely on research and interaction and often do teaching and often work with lots of people who don't have those skill sets so they're they're perfect for academics i love them what kind of questions are appropriate to ask the hiring manager? Should you expect that there will be follow-up interviews with other managers? Um, typically, you know, I often find that the first uh, round of interviews is uh, I, usually five. So it's the hiring manager, three people from a team or a related thing, and one from HR or recruiting. And then if they think you're either interesting or if there are two candidates who are very different, for example, sometimes they bring in other people to do like comparative interviews, for example. Um, so the kind of questions uh, that are appropriate to ask a hiring manager are anything you're interested in. But some of the things I always ask are, what's the hardest problem you solve? Like, what is it, you know, what problems do you think are in your way? And how do you want the person taking this job to help get rid of those problems? You know, where do you see your company in the next five years? Like, what do you, what do you think that, that your company currently can't do that you want it to be able to do? Be looking to the future and how you can contribute to it. If a gap in your employment is un unavoidable, what is the best way to frame it so the hiring the employed bias does not work against you? Um, so it depends on the reason for the gap. Um, you know, it's harder to describe a gap if you've been in prison than a gap if you have um, been raising young children. Um, so what you what you what you what you want to do is you want to show because you know because really unless you were flying to Mars and been put in one of those weird chambers you were doing something so what you want to do is describe what you were doing and describe what you learned from it you know because you were never not learning and you were never not doing something so just you know be clear about what that is and I also um, I have a blog post about that it's not listed here but I have one. What about accepting LinkedIn connections from people one doesn't know, but who are in the same LinkedIn groups, like professional associations and so on? Uh, my personal rule is not to accept LinkedIn connections from people I do not know. Because if they, if somebody says, hey, Anne, you know, would you be willing to introduce me to so-and-so and I don't know so-and-so, or I don't know the person asking, uh, I'm not willing to risk my personal reputation. Um, when it is a, from, a, from a learned society or something else like that, uh, your mileage may vary. Uh, I do not do it personally. Do you have a list of contract firms? No, because they are so specific to fields. Contract firms generally specialize. And so 
a better way to do it is talk to folks in career services or talk to pe and talk to people in your field and find out who they have used. Um, but it's very field specific. Should I aim for different strategies to write my resume if I'm applying um, to a job through online portal versus when I am internally introduced or recommended? No. Um, how do we connect to hiring managers most directly? Do we apply directly online through LinkedIn or go to the company's page? Um, you apply for how they tell you to apply. If they tell you to apply online, you apply online. If they tell you to go through HR, you go through HR. If they tell you to go through recruiting, you go through recruiting. If you have a personal connection, if somebody has recommended you for the job, then in the uh, cover letter you say, one of the many reasons I'm interested in this job is so-and-so, whom I respect greatly, uh, told me that this was a, a great company, a great project, a great whatever. When jobs ask for a research summary, should you try to include skills instead of your research um, if it's not particularly applicable to that job? If so, do you have any recommendations on how to do that? You should, when somebody asks for a research summary, you should say, here is the research and the, you know, the critical techniques I used were A, B, and C. And then you, what you might wanna have is a sentence like, um, additional techniques that were related but that I didn't use on this particular project were D, E, and F. Um, but what you should do is answer the question asked. So if they ask about your research, describe the research and describe the things relevant to the research. Because if they ask about it, that's what they want to know about. One person wants to take a break after they graduate. Will this gap in my resume be seen poorly? Take a break and do what? They don't say, and it's anonymous, <laughs> an okay, anonymous okay. question. Okay, but if it is take a break and travel, or if it is take a break and work, or if it is take a break and go to, you know, the CIA's cooking school and, and learn how to make buttercream roses or whatever it is you wanna do, you just have to have a good reason to explain why you did it and why you took that break. Mm -hmm. Um, for those who have finished this term thinking they might be able to find temporary employment like um, a bartender, like the example you gave Anna, and now find themselves unable to find even an interim job, is this kind of gap a hindrance? Well, uh, for any situation but the one we're in, I might have said yes, um, but it's not like people don't know about COVID, you mm -hmm. know? And so I think you explain how you look for work and what you were doing. Um, and if you were willing to go do frontline work, you know, if you were willing to work in a grocery store or, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, but I think there is no one who will not understand uh, the current situation. What are the norms about adding former students on LinkedIn if you are their GSI, their teaching assistant? Um, the norm is that you should not add them while you are in a position to have any power over them because they are not in a position to say no. So if you add students on LinkedIn, make it's important to consider whether they are still likely to ask you for a recommendation, for example. Um, but then I think it is okay. Mm -hmm. um, what you must not do is abuse the power imbalance. Now that most applications require hand inputting your resume and experience, I was told that my work experience likely doesn't get credited in a way that would get beyond a resume bot. How do I get past these AI systems? Okay, uh, another rant is coming. <laughs> do not try to game the bots. Um, what you must do at all times and in all places, is describe your skills as accurately as you can and as truthfully as you can. Because you will get by the bots when you are applying for a job for which you are well suited. But just like tossing random word salad in, like 
project manager and two years and product manager is not helpful. Um, because the stuff is getting, first of all, the stuff is getting more sophisticated uh, in that it can tell when garbage words have been thrown in. But the other thing is, suppose you got by a bot and then you got to the interview and then the words you had thrown in were not suited to what you actually can do, mm -hmm. right? That's not helpful. Um, one person is wondering about reaching out to contacts and organizations who they've met, but aren't, they're not sure if they'd remember them because they weren't thinking about job searching at the time. So, right. So the way you reach out is exactly the same way you reach out, which is, hello, so-and-so. Um, I met you a number of years ago in venue X. Mm -hmm. I am currently interested in applying for work at your company Y. I have a specific question question. Would you be willing to spend a little bit of time talking to me about that question? Do you have websites, um, job search websites you would recommend? Um, so in resources, so here's some of the ones that I think are helpful. Uh, let's add, there we go. Um, Payscale.com is really good because it talks about the thing that causes most people incredible anxiety, which is um, uh, salary and benefit negotiation. Glassdoor.com is also really good about it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I flatter myself that my website is good. It is filled with helpful information. Uh, and it's uh, the graduate and postdoc tab on ancrook.com. Um, I think those sites uh, are all pretty good. Um, you know, those, oh, oh, and the Twitter feed of careers in Gov is great. Just because it is not a site as such, but what it does is put a lot of job descriptions in front of you. And it, it expands what the marketing people teach us to call the consideration set, like the things that you actually care about. We have a follow up from the person who asked the question about the UX research job. Would uh -huh. you suggest also requesting um, their interviewers and recruiter from that position? Um, which they were not offered on LinkedIn. So could they reach out to those folks on LinkedIn? Oh, for a connection? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we have one last question. Any recommendations for speakers or writers to model your writing voice after for interested and intelligent audiences? This seems like a very broad um, question. So what you have to do is you have to read widely and think who's interesting. So the slide I have in front of you at the moment has four books that I rely on all the time. And the last three in particular manifest really different writing styles and it is worth thinking about them. So Atul Gawande has done the most persuasive work I have read about how to manage large blobby projects, which is exactly what a job search is. Mm -hmm. um, and the checklist manifesto, I think, is marvelous because it is written for such a broad audience. Also, um, his, he has another book uh, called, he has several books, but he has another one called On Being Mortal, and it's about handling issues around the end of life. And it's worth looking at those two books together to see um, how he modulates for different audiences. Uh, Amanda Littman, Run for Something, uh, is a book about why uh, particularly young people should run for office. And, but the reason I bring it up in this context is that uh, she uses profanity the way I use punctuation. And Interestingly, uh, for some people, that is not their kind of language, and so that this is not your kind of book. Um, but it's worth reading it and getting a sense of how deliberately she uses it and how she modulates it. And then Molly Weisenberg, who is a former graduate student who transitioned to make her own career out of being a food blogger before that was a thing and is now a restaurateur. Um, is a narrative style about how she describes how she made her own life. Um, so I think all those three are good, but uh, I will say that the way you discover a writing style you like is to read a lot of writing styles. 
Great. I, it's a miracle that we <laughs> answered almost 40 questions in 30 minutes. So um, you're really good at concise, um, punchy answers. So thank you, Dr. Krug. I know um, some folks um, have headed out already, but I just wanted to flag for the 85 folks who are still here. Um, Kristen Jensen did put um, a link to our um, evaluation. Just we always appreciate feedback on any of our workshops in the chat. And we will also, we got lots of questions about, are we going to get the slides? As Dr. Krug said, we will send out Definitely. Um, the slides and the presentation once we um, take that down from the cloud um, and send that out to you all as well. So thank you again um, for this great workshop, um, Dr. Krug. And um, thank you to everyone who attended this session for your excellent questions. I could tell people were really engaged because we got something like 60 questions total. So thank you again, everyone. I'm going to stop our recording. Okay, stop the recording. And then if you will hang uh, just for a moment, I think that uh -huh. would be helpful so everybody else can, you know, can bail.